Hi everybody, welcome to 2ZQ Hot Takes, where we discuss issues both big and small. I am your host, the very handsome Tim Kirk, and this time I'll be talking about the extraordinary history of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and a bunch of the square parks, Washington Square, Tompkins, Union, and Madison Square Parks, with mentions of Worth, Greeley, and Abingdon too. The New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, also called the Parks Department, or NYC Parks, is the department of the government of New York City responsible for maintaining the city's park system, preserving and maintaining the ecological diversity of New York City's natural areas, and furnishing recreational opportunities for city residents and visitors. NYC Parks maintains more than 1,700 parks, playgrounds, and recreation facilities across the city's five boroughs. It is responsible for 1,000 playgrounds, 800 playing fields, 550 tennis courts, 35 major recreation centers, 66 pools, 14 miles of beaches, and 13 golf courses, as well as seven nature centers, six ice skating rinks, over 2,000 green streets, and four major stadiums. NYC Parks also cares for park flora and fauna, community gardens, 23 historic houses, over 1,200 statues and monuments, and more than 2.5 million trees. The total area of the properties maintained by the department is over 30,000 acres. The largest single component of parkland maintained by the department is the 2,765-acre Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx. Hey, not Central Park! Other large parks administered by NYC Parks include Central Park in Manhattan, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, Van Cortland Park in the Bronx, they got a lot of park space in the Bronx, Flushing Meadows Corona Park in Queens, and the Staten Island Greenbelt in Staten Island. NYC Parks produces many special events, including concerts and movie premieres. In the summer, the busiest season, the agency organizes free carnivals and concerts and sends mobile recreation vans to travel throughout the five boroughs, providing free rental equipment for skating, baseball, and miniature golf. That's pretty cool. The department is a mayoral agency. The original Parks Commission was formed in 1856 and was responsible only for Central Park. In 1870, the Tweed Charter gave a jurisdiction for all the parks in Manhattan. In addition, each borough had its own independent park commission. A unified citywide New York City Parks Department was formed in 1934 with Robert Moses as the commissioner, a position he held until 1960. The New York City Department of Parks and Recreation maintains facilities and provides services through a network of public service workers, volunteers, and partnerships with private organizations. The momentum for private partnerships increased dramatically during the mayoralty of Michael Bloomberg. Often the initiatives of Parks Commissioner Adrian Benepe were controversial. Many businesses that operate or generate revenue on New York City parkland are considered concessions and must obtain a permit or a license from the Revenue Division of Parks. Approximately 500 concessions currently operate in parks throughout the five boroughs, and they generally fall into two categories, food service and recreation. The food service concessions range from push carts selling hot dogs to restaurants such as Tavern on the Green and Terrace on the Park. Recreational concessions include facilities such as ice rinks, stables, marinas, and golf courses. Washington Square Park is a 9.75-acre public park in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of Lower Manhattan, New York City. One of the best known of New York City's public parks, it is an icon as well as a meeting place and center for cultural activity. It is operated by the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Man, I can't tell you how much time I have spent there. The song, Washington Square by the Village Stompers from 1963, is featured in the super cool HBO series, The Outsider. The park is an open space dominated by the Washington Square Arch at the northern gateway to the park, with a tradition of celebrating nonconformity, and it is one of the most iconic sites in the world. The park's fountain area has been one of the city's most popular spots for residents and tourists. Most of the buildings surrounding the park now belong to New York University, but many have at one time served as homes and studios for artists. 
Some of the buildings have been built by NYU, while others have been converted from their former uses into academic and residential buildings. Located at the foot of Fifth Avenue, the park is bordered by Washington Square North, known as Waverly Place, east and west of the park, Washington Square East, known as University Place, north of the park, Washington Square South, known as West 4th Street, east and west of the park, and Washington Square West, known as McDougal Street, north and south of the park. While the park contains many flower beds and trees, little of the park is used for plantings due to the paving. The two prominent features are the Washington Square Arch and a large fountain. It includes children's play areas, trees and gardens, paths to stroll on, a chess and scrabble playing area, park benches, picnic tables, commemorative statuary, and two dog runs. Those commemorated by statues and monuments include George Washington, Italian patriot and soldier Giuseppe Garibaldi, commander of the insurrectionist forces in Italy struggles for unification, and Alexander Lyman Holly, a talented engineer who helped start the American steel industry after the invention of the Bessemer process for mass-producing steel. Amazingly enough, the land was once divided by a narrow, marshy valley through which Mineta Creek, or Brook, ran. In the 17th century, a Native American village known as the Sapokanikan, or Tobacco Field, was nearby. By the mid-17th century, the land on each side of the Mineta was used as farmland by the Dutch. The Dutch gave the land, then outside of city limits, Wall Street, to Angolan residents of the colony, intending for their plots and settlements to serve as a buffer zone to hostile Native Americans outside the settlement. How wild! In 1643, a group of half-freed slaves and elders such as Domingo Anthony, Manuel Trumpeter, and Catalina Anthony received land grants to build and maintain farms in the areas containing and surrounding Washington Square Park. The families who received the land were no longer slaves, but had to give a portion of the profits they received from the land to the Dutch West India Company and pay annual land fees. Their children would be born as slaves rather than free. The area became the core of an early African-American community in New York, then called the Land of the Blacks, and later Little Africa. I uh, had no idea that was true. Among those who owned parcels in what is now Washington Square Park was Paulo de Angola. It remained farmland until April 1797, when the Common Council of New York purchased the fields to the east of Mineta, which was not yet within the city limits, for a new potter's field or public burial ground. It was used mainly for burying unknown or indigent people when they died. But when New York, which did not include this area yet, went through yellow fever epidemics in the early 19th century, most of those who died from yellow fever were also buried there, safely away from town as a hygienic measure. Echoes of today. A legend in many tourist guides says that the large elm at the northwest corner of the park, Hangman's Elm, was the old hanging tree. However, research indicates that the tree was on the side of the former Mineta Creek that was the back garden of a private house. Records of only one public hanging at the Potter's Field exists. Oh, well then. Two eyewitnesses to the recorded hanging offer differing opinions of the location of the gallows. One said it had been put up at a spot where the fountain was prior to the 2007 park redesign, Others placed the gallows closer to where the arch is now. However, the cemetery was closed in 1825. To this day, the remains of more than 20,000 bodies rest under Washington Square. Excavations have found tombstones under the park dating as far back as 1799. Wow. And I have stomped all over their graves. In 1826, the city bought the land west of Mineta Creek. The square was laid out and leveled, and it was turned into Washington Military Parade Ground. Military parade grounds were public spaces specified by the city where volunteer militia companies responsible for the nation's defense would train. The streets surrounding the square became one of the city's most desirable residential areas in the 1830s. The protected row of Greek revival houses on the north side of the park remains from that time. How about that? In 1849 and 1850, the parade ground was reworked into the first park on the site. More paths were added, and a new fence was built around it. 
1871, it came under the control of the newly formed New York City Department of Parks, and it was redesigned again with curving rather than straight secondary paths. In 1889, to celebrate the centennial of George Washington's inauguration as President of the United States, a large plaster and wood memorial arch was erected over Fifth Avenue just north of the park. The temporary plaster and wood arch was so popular that in 1892, a permanent Tuckahoe marble arch designed by New York City architect Stanford White was erected, standing 77 feet and modeled after the Arc de Triomphe, built in Paris in 1806. During the excavations for the eastern part of the arch, human remains, a coffin, and a gravestone dated to 1803 were uncovered under 10 feet below ground. More remains! The first fountain next to the arch was completed in 1852 and replaced in 1872. The statue of Giuseppe Garibaldi was unveiled in 1888. In 1918, two statues of George Washington were added to the north side. Robert Moses embarked on a crusade to fully redesign the park and local activists began an opposing fight that lasted three decades. Jane Jacobs and Shirley Hayes led those long-fought battles and eventually prevailed. Since around the end of World War II, folk singers had been congregating on warm Sunday afternoons at the fountain in the center of the park. Believe it or not, Tension and conflicts began to develop between the Bohemian element, yay, Bohemian element, and the remaining working class residents of the neighborhood. The city began showing increasing hostility to the use of public facilities by the public. What? And in 1947, began requiring permits before public performances could be given in any city park. In the spring of 1961, the new parks commissioner refused a permit to the folk singers for their Sunday afternoon gatherings because the folk singers have been bringing too many undesirable beatnik elements into the park. On April 9, 1961, folk music pioneer Izzy Young, the owner of the Folklore Center, who had been trying to get permits for the folk singers and about 500 musicians and supporters, gathered in the park and sang songs without a permit then held a procession from the park through the arch at 5th Avenue and marched to the Judson Memorial Church on the other side of the park. At about the time the musicians and friends reached the church, the New York City Police Department riot squad was sent into the park, attacked civilians with billy clubs, and arrested 10 people. The incident made the front pages of newspapers as far away as Washington, D.C. The New York Mirror initially reported it as a beatnik riot, but retracted the headline in the next edition, although tensions remain for a while. Imagine beatnik tensions. Skibbity bop, Clyde! There have been various plans for renovation as well as organized protest lawsuits against them. It has been a hotbed for controversy for a very long time and a contentious space, which belies its welcoming atmosphere. Washington Square has long been a hub for politics and culture in New York City. The presence of street performers has been one of the defining characteristics of Washington Square Park. For many years, people visiting the park have been mingling with buskers, performers, musicians, and poets. Because of a change in policy on the 2010 rule that involved artists, the new ruling that was to come in on May 8, 2013, would involve entertainers. This could mean that performers could be fined $250 for the first offense and up to $1,000 for further violations. The 2010 rule on which the 2013 ruling was based stated that artists could not sell within 50 feet of a monument or 5 feet from any bench or fence. Uh, yeah. Boo! I used to see the late, great Charlie Barnett perform there. I saw him rise and fall victim to his addictions in and around the park. He used to grab people by the arm and cluster hundreds of people into an audience while he performed outside of the fountain. He was absolutely hilarious. He passed the hat and did pretty good, too. Later, when he was suffering from drug addiction, he would stand on the pedestals of street lamps just outside the park and collect just a few people to do just a few minutes and then pass the hat and buy drugs. He became infected with HIV via intravenous drug use and died from AIDS. Not to be confused with the hottie Charlie Barnett from Russian Doll Tales of the City and Arrow. I saw so many performers there, I lost track. Day or night, it was incredible. Some were awful, a lot were really good, and a few were absolutely great. 
In 1834, NYU decided to use prison labor to dress the stone for its new building across from the park, as prison labor from Sing Sing was cheaper than hiring local stonemasons. This, the stonecutters of the city said, was taking the bread out of their mouths. They held a rally in Washington Square Park, and then the first labor march in the city. That turned into a riot, and the 27th New York Regiment was called out to quell the stonecutters. The regiment camped in Washington Square Park for four days and nights until the excitement subsided. New York University continued their use of prison labor. NYU, lording over the village since the 19th century. In 1912, approximately 20,000 workers, including 5,000 women, marched to the park to commemorate the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire, which had killed 146 workers the year before. Many of the women wore fitted, tucked front blouses like those manufactured by the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. This clothing style became the working man's uniform and a symbol of female independence, reflecting the alliance of labor and suffrage movements. Over 25,000 people marched on the park demanding women's suffrage in 1915. How about that? In 1888, Robert Louis Stevenson, visiting the U.S. to seek medical help for his battle with consumption, talked to Mark Twain in the park. In the years before and after World War I, the park was a center for many American artists, writers, and activists, including the photographer Andre Cartes, who photographed the square during winter. Later, the park was a gathering area for the beat generation, folk, and hippie movements of the 50s and 60s. In 1958, Buddy Holly, a nearby resident of Greenwich Village, spent time in the park both listening to people play and helping guitarists with musical chords. Can you imagine being tutored for free by Buddy Holly? Wow, that is so amazing. On September 27th, 2007, Democratic presidential candidate Barack Obama held a rally at Washington Square. 20,000 people registered for the event and the crowds overflowed past security gates set up as a cordon. The New York Times described the rally as one of the largest campaign events of the year. Washington Square is a setting of New York native Henry James' novel, Washington Square. The park was featured extensively in the 2007 film I Am a Legend, which is still on cable all the time. The protagonist, Dr. Robert Neville, played by Will Smith, lived directly across the street from the park. It was used as a major action piece, especially in the last scenes of the film. Washington Square is the titular park in the 1967 Jane Fonda and Robert Redford film, Barefoot in the Park, taking its title from the climactic scene where Corey says Paul is so uptight that he won't even just walk barefoot in the park with her. I wouldn't either, so, uh, well, then, nothing against you, Jane, but it's just yucky. Built-in outdoor chess tables on the southwest corner encouraged playing along with throngs of watchers. In his youth, Stanley Kubrick was a frequent player. These tables were featured in the films Searching for Bobby Fischer and Fresh. The Washington Square tables form the cornerstone of what is Manhattan's chess district at the area around the park. The park was also the starting line during the premiere of the 30th season of The Amazing Race. A 1958 Jane Jacobs-led demonstration against Robert Moses' plan for the park is featured in a 2017 episode of the Amazon series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. The park served as a battleground for Iron Man, Spider-Man, and Cull Obsidian at the beginning of the movie Avengers Infinity War. So, you know, wicked cool! Tompkins Square Park as a 10.5-acre park in Alphabet City. The square-shaped park bounded on the north by East 10th Street, on the east by Avenue B, on the south by East 7th Street, and on the west by Avenue A, is abutted by St. Mark's to the west. The park opened in 1834 and is named for Daniel D. Tompkins, Vice President of the United States under President James Monroe and the Governor of New York from 1807 until 1817. He had overseen some early drainage in the locality in connection with minor fortifications in the War of 1812. The park was opened in 1850. Tompkins Square Park is located on land near the East River that originally consisted of salt marsh and open tidal meadows originally owned by the Stuyvesant family, descendants of Peter Stuyvesant. There have been riots there since 1857. The most recent was in 1988. 
1857, immigrants protesting unemployment and food shortages were attacked by police. In 1863, the deadly draft riots occurred in the park. On January 13, 1874, the Tompkins Square riot occurred in the park when police crushed a demonstration involving thousands of workers. The riot marked an unprecedented era of labor conflict and violence. The riot occurred in the midst of the Panic of 1873, a depression that began in 1873 and lasted for several years. Workers' movements throughout the United States had been making demands of the government to help ease the strain of the depression. Organizations rejected the offers of charity and instead had asked for public works programs that would provide jobs for masses of unemployed. In 1877, 5,000 people fought with the National Guard when a crowd massed to hear communist revolutionary speeches. On April 7, 1897, a rabbi was arrested for not obtaining a permit for the performance of Birkat Hachama, a Jewish ritual done once every 28 years. In the middle of the 19th century, the square included a large parade ground for drilling the New York National Guard. The modern layout of the park by Robert Moses in 1936 is said to be intended to divide and manage crowds that had gathered there in protest since the 1870s. The tradition was rekindled as the park became the nursery of demonstrations against the Vietnam War in the 1960s. By the 1980s, Tompkins Square Park had become, for many New Yorkers, synonymous with the city's increased social problems. The park at that time was a high-crime area that contained encampments of homeless people, and it was a center for illegal drug dealing and heroin use. My personal experience was to avoid entering the park during those years whenever possible. And if you went inside, it was during the daytime. And you would see broken park benches with all the wood slats to sit on broken or removed. The concrete forms for the seats broken or jagged. And the ground had very little or any grass. It was hard and somewhat shiny and completely littered with used syringes and needles. I just did not want to go inside. I often hung out in the East Village and would sit at Benny's Burritos, sipping margaritas, and watch what I called the Junkie Parade. I would watch people who became rock stars and cultural heroes over time just stroll by, like John Lurie. And as a side, I do have to mention both Stromboli's Pizza, which was always and is still great, for sure, and the original Holiday Cocktail Lounge. W.H. Auden, Ralph Ginsberg, and Frank Sinatra hung out there, too. And they are both a little over a block from the park, but the holiday. It was one of a kind. Nowadays, it is an expensive cocktail lounge, but back then it was super cool. And what a dive. It had the very best jukebox in the entire city. The front of the building was usually crowded with punks wearing colored mohawks and kilts and black leather jackets and knee-high lace-up boots year-round and all that accoutrement. When I went, it was owned by two crusty old brothers who did not seem to like their clientele all that much. I would order a drink, and then half the time, the rim of the glass was covered in lipstick, so the owner bartender would glare at me and turn the glass around as if all I had to do was just sip from the other side of the glass because he did not want to clean the glass or make a fresh drink. And he stared me down for the rest of the time I was there. The men's room was eternally crowded by the swarm of flies around the light bulb, and they just stacked empty beer cases against the wall to the ceiling. I was chatting with a guy there who was pretty cool, but people kept on calling him shithead. And I got curious. Asked him why he let people call him shithead. And it turned out he was a guy whose alias was Joey Shithead from the Canadian punk band DOA, who just happened to be there, and people recognized him. He is now a politician in British Columbia. Ha! I was playing a video game with a guy named Roger, who had a very goth punk look for way back then. He had a black lacquered mohawk and wore white makeup with black mascara and eyeliner and black lipstick and black nail polish, and he was wearing a black coat and what was a warm bar in the summer. So I had my turn, and then he had his. There was a guy leaning against a video game console with a beer in his hand who looked just like Billy Idol. I asked Roger, who's your Billy Idol looking friend? And he said, Billy Idol. I said, hi, Billy. He said, oi! And that was my sum total of experience with Billy Idol. Another time, I was with my buddy and his then-wife, and he tugged on my sleeve and said, Dylan, Dylan, it's Dylan. And I looked, and I said, where? Where's Bob Dylan? And it was Matt Dylan. Well, that's still cool. He was flanked by twins, both wearing patent leather lace-up bodysuits. One was black, and the other was red. 
The one in black had a red Nina Blackwood-esque wig, and the one in red had a black Nina Blackwood-esque wig. That was a sight to behold. Nina Blackwood was one of the original MTV VJs, by the way. But the junkies on Avenue A. Oh, man. One time, I saw and watched a junkie who was very much in the thrall of an emotional episode pick up a galvanized steel trash can and smash it on the wrought iron divider outside the building. You know, like between the door and the garbage cans. His girlfriend had locked him out of the building, and, and he kept on smashing it until it was crumpled. He was shirtless and shoeless and very obviously disturbed. But that was normal. He wouldn't bat an eye. I would go to 7A, Benny's, Alcatraz, King Tut's Wawa Hut, the Pyramid just a little south of it, and on the odd occasion, the Life Cafe, but not for the food, but for the wild bulletin board. It was a sight. I knew and worked with somebody who grew up on the other side of the park on Avenue B, and her father refused to allow her and her sister to leave the house without an armed escort from him. He personally chauffeured them to and from work while packing heat and made it very obvious that he was carrying a loaded weapon, even on West 26th Street, where we worked together. I also attended an art show with my brother in one of those old rickety tenement buildings that you had to walk up a long, creaky staircase to get to, and it was wild. I think it was called Women in the Streets. And, you know, it was the East Village art scene of the 80s, replete with a microphone for, I guess, poetry readings or performance art. I got up and started doing my best Monty Python-esque into the mic, and several people stood there nodding appreciatively until somebody came up and asked me to leave. I was amazed I got that far. It was so great. The park had become a symbol of the problems of the city, including homelessness, which had prompted the 1988 riot. Against that backdrop, Daniel Rakowitz shocked the neighborhood in 1989 when he murdered Monica Beryl. Dismembered her, made soup out of her body, and served it to the homeless people in the park. Rakowitz, called the Butcher of Tompkins Square, was found not guilty by reason of insanity and remains incarcerated at the Kirby Forensic Psychiatric Center in Wards Island. Another intersection from my previous podcast, 2ZQ Hot Takes 59, The Devil and Mr. Tim, where the devil worshiper I knew was implicated in the Rackwitz murder to whatever extent he was. And you can download that one too. From June 91 till July 92, the park was closed to the public for restoration, but also to keep out the homeless and in an attempt to calm tensions. Increasing gentrification in the East Village during the 1990s and 2000s and enforcement of a park curfew and the eviction of homeless people have changed the character of Tompkins Square Park. Today, with its playgrounds and basketball courts, dog run, ping pong table, handball courts, and built-in chess tables, the park attracts young families, students, and seniors and tourists from all over the globe. The outdoor drag festival Wigstock held in the park is now part of the Howell Festival. The Charlie Parker Jazz Festival is a musical tribute to the former resident of Avenue B, Bird. In 2007, the New Village Music Festival was formed. This is a community music festival dedicated to celebrating New York's diverse music scene. In addition, the event highlights the importance of music and cultural arts programs throughout the city. Since the 1980s, the asphalt that covers the multipurpose courts at Tompkins Square Park has served as a skate park and training grounds for generations of skateboarders. There was also an annual event in August commemorating the 1988 police riot that features neighborhood bands. The Food Not Bombs Manhattan chapter serves every Sunday in the park, rain or shine. Cultural services of the French Embassy of the United States and the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation have a popular free outdoor French film festival which shows critically acclaimed French films each Friday at sunset in city parks including Tompkins during June and July. One of Tompkins Square Park's most prominent features is its collection of venerable American elm trees. One elm in particular, located next to the semicircular arrangement of benches in the park center, is important to adherents of Hare Krishna. It was beneath this tree on October 9, 1966, that the founder of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness held the first recorded outdoor chanting session of the Hare Krishna Mantra, outside of the Indian subcontinent. Participants in the ceremony included beat poet Allen Ginsberg. He got around. The event is seen as the founding of the Hare Krishna religion in the United States, and the tree is treated by Krishna adherents as a significant religious site. 
The Tompkins Square Dog Run was the first dog run in New York City. It opened in 1990. Only 1990. The run hosts the annual Tompkins Square Halloween Dog Parade to raise money to help maintain the run. This is the biggest dog Halloween party in the United States, boasting an annual attendance of more than 400 dogs in costume and 2,000 spectators. The park contains three monuments. There is a monument on the north side of the park to the General Slocum boating disaster on June 15, 1904. This was the greatest single loss of life in New York City prior to September 11, 2001. Over a thousand people, mainly German immigrant mothers and children, drowned in the East River that day. The area near the park, formerly known as Klein Deutschland, effectively dissolved in grief as shattered German families moved away. This disaster is also memorialized in James Joyce's novel, Ulysses. The southeast corner of the park also contains a statue of Samuel S. Cox, a New York City politician who served in the U.S. House of Representatives from Ohio and New York and a U.S. minister to the Ottoman Empire in 1885 to 1886. The Temperance Fountain, located near Avenue A, south of 9th Street Transverse, was erected in 1888 during the Temperance Movement to give people free access to clean drinking water so they wouldn't have to drink alcohol for refreshment. This neoclassical fountain was a gift of the wealthy San Francisco dentist, businessman, and temperance crusader, Henry D. Cogswell. The fountain is a square granite kiosk with four stone columns supporting a canopy on whose sides the words faith, hope, charity, and temperance are chiseled. Atop this canopy is the Greek goddess Hebe, cupbearer to the gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus. How about that? That's it for part one. Thanks for listening. See you next time. And as the kitties say, peace out.